Welcome to the Startup Grind. Thank you. I love the pink in this room. I want a picture with everybody in pink at the end. Okay, so we always start up every Startup Grind and just get a little bit of understanding and background and where you grew up. So how did this Irish Catholic girl from upstate New York get female Viagra approved? <laughs> That's a good story. Um, I, I did. I grew up in upstate New York. I moved my whole life. I said I'm nomadic. Um, so I've lived east coast, west coast, and actually deliberately uh, selected the triangle uh, when I started businesses. I've been thrilled to be here for a little over a decade now. So everybody's interested in you know, why did you become an entrepreneur? Um, two reasons. Uh, one is one that all of you in this room already know, and that is I believe that the path to your greatest success is through ownership. Um, no, everything changes when you have skin in the game, right? How you make decisions, um, everything. Maybe the, the other one um, is more an indicator of me, and that is that I just didn't fit. I didn't fit in classic corporate America. Um, I think that when I was in cultures in which they try to homogenize you, right, it's our way. So this is our way of doing things. Um, it just didn't make sense for me. I actually think that the companies that achieve true greatness are those that celebrate individuality, uh, that let you be you, quirks and all. Uh, I've got a pretty quirky team, and I think they're pretty spectacular. Um, so I would say two reasons, ownership, for sure, uh, as the path, and, and that, man, I'm just not cut out for, uh, for big companies. So we always like to talk about the very first company you started. I think that's important to help people understand about the journey. Yep. So let's go back to the first company you started. Tell us a little bit about that venture and how it ended up. So uh, I actually, my very first company, I don't talk about a lot, I actually had a company called Truth and Beauty uh, that was, uh, I guess by commercial standards, a failure. Um, not an overall failure. I had acquired this great technology out of University of Western Australia. Um, that was going to revolutionize uh, skin care, sun care particularly, um, and ultimately did so well with the initial burst that the owners of the business wanted the North American rights back. Um, they ended up in a lawsuit and had to pay me for them, so I guess it's not a complete failure, uh, but it never did get to market, uh, even though I wanted it to. So that was the predecessor to Slate uh, Pharmaceuticals, which I started also here locally, and it was, in fact, exactly what I said, it was the clean slate, do it on my own terms, um, go out, make the mistakes myself, uh, and find those people, again, like me, right? The hypothesis was, here I was in an industry that I loved, pharma, right, for what it could do, I just didn't necessarily like the way in which it got it done, or the cultures in which, um, you know, the companies sort of got their, their mission uh, accomplished. I think we lost touch a little bit with patients. Um, so the slate was the hypothesis that there have got to be a lot of people like me, right? They're achieving in those environments, but completely uninspired. And if I got that band of people together, what would happen? And uh, what happened was really uh, remarkable, I think, in building that, and that's what ultimately led me to Sprout. We sprouted out of Slate. That's where the name came from. I've heard much more interesting descriptions, <laughs> um, but that's in fact where it came. So I think it's super important to talk about the mistakes you made with the first company. Sure. You brought up a little bit, but I want you to kind of go in in-depth detail talking about that, because again, it's super important for people to understand you know, the mistakes you made and how you overcame them. Yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes. Where do I begin? Um, look, at, at the end of the day, you're going to have uh, an idea and a conviction, and you got to take it all the way, right? You, at the, from the beginning, I think the conviction, you take it to the mat. I'll tell it really more in the Sprout story. Uh, you know, when we got involved with that, I thought, win or lose, we're going to have this conversation and it's going to be evidence based. And that's what kept us going through rejection, uh, through a lot of difficulty. Um, and I think that was no different than, than the beginning, right? The mistakes, things happen. Nothing, you know, you don't realize it fully, uh, necessarily, the way that you envisioned it in your mind, but you keep going. And if, in fact, the right answer is to walk away from it, you find the next thing. And you, you find the conviction in that, and you see it all the way through, whatever that outcome is. Uh, you know, for us, when we started out at Sprout, the, the goal of the team was never to get the next billion dollar drug approved. The goal of the team was to change the conversation about female sexuality. 
And when that came, I think great success came uh, alongside of it. But we, our definition of success is that women today have an opportunity to make the choice for themselves whether or not they want treatment, medical treatment, for what we've known as a medical condition for decades. When you and I met, we sat down and we talked about Sprout. So let's go there. And really tell us. A lot of interesting stories. I, don't, I didn't know much about life sciences until we had that conversation. But it was very interesting. So let's go back and talk about why you started Sprout. You know, I know what the mission behind Women's Health, but why you started it. And really just talk about building that company to where it is to the exit. Sure. So Slate was a company in male sexual health. Um, so I, I knew it on the guy side. And, uh, and because of that, I would go to meetings, the sexual medicine meetings. Who knew there was a sexual medicine society, right? Any of you who've heard me talk know that I love to say I'm a card-carrying member of the sexual medicine society, which makes me a great guest at a cocktail party. Um, so here I am in this world, um, and I'm cheering on completely from the sidelines that finally we're going to have one for women. At this point, there are 26 FDA-approved drugs that treat some form of male sexual dysfunction, and not until last year was there one on the board for women's most common sexual dysfunction. So here I am, watching the science emerge, cheering them on, finally, here's a drug, in fact, that matches mechanistically what we understand is happening for these women, as opposed to, hey, here's a drug for men, let's see if it works in women. And that happens all the time. That happened with Viagra. They studied it actually at length to treat this condition. And I always say I could have saved Pfizer millions of dollars uh, by telling them that desire in women was not a blood flow issue. Uh, it's in the brain. Um, and, and the truth is it is in the brain. So here's the great stuff that was emerging, right? There's spectacular science here. We know from brain scan imaging that women with this condition, hypoactive sexual desire disorder, HSDD, um, they have a different response. So put two women in a PET scan and a functional MRI, expose them to erotic stimuli, the woman with HSDD, her brain does not light up, it does not deactivate in the prefrontal cortex to go into the sexual experience. So the, the, the aha moment is, here's a company, great science, they get turned down by the FDA and they walk. And I'm looking at the science going, wait a minute, is everybody else looking at what I'm looking at? Because there it is in black and white. Right? We understand this scientifically. The reason they were walking away is because we have a very firm narrative that all things in the bedroom for women are psychology, and all things in the bedroom for men are biology, as witnessed by those 26 drugs, one of which was mine. Right? That makes no sense. We actually, all genders in here, we bring both things into the bedroom with us, biology and psychology alike. And women who had a biological issue that was getting in the way of their sexual desire we were not addressing the need, and that just didn't seem right to me. So that's where it started. Um, how did it go from there? What do you do? We, we, uh, we did actually something that seems unbelievable. We spent a year talking to women, right? I'd like to say if, if Sprout had a superpower, it was empathy. In fact, that's what I did. Sat down with women and said, what is this doing in your life? What is the definition of success? And having spent a year seeing, I think, firsthand just how devastating this was. Look, sex for us is the joke, right? I just said that about being at the cocktail party. That's the light way to talk about it. Um, you know, people say, well, no one will ever lose their life, right, from HSCD, but they may well lose their life as they know it. Things happen in their marriages. Uh, things happen to self-esteem. And I think spending a year with women really informed why we had to do it why we had to see it all the way through, and it required actually that I sell off my other business to take this on, which by the way, you guys know in this room, was really hard, because we were finally out of that startup mode, you know, we were finally really hit, we'd hit our stride, we were growing, we'd become the second most prescribed testosterone among urologists, which was no small feat. The only company that was ahead of us was actually the one who first introduced it to the market, back in the early 2000s, um, so we'd accomplished a lot. But that spending time with women made it very clear of what we needed to do. So we sat down with the FDA. We got it a year later. We sat down with the FDA. We said, do we understand the path forward? Uh, they said, yep, there you go. We went off. We did the work. 
we did a huge pivotal trial, a lot of addition, uh, additional challenge studies with the drug, and then when we got back, they, they got a review period. Six months later, we met all of our endpoints, right? We were feeling good. We had done the work. Um, and, uh, and I thought, look, I, I get this from the male side, like here we did, we, we've delivered the goods. And at the end of that review, they said, no. And that was a, probably our lowest moment, right? Is it over? Uh, they just said no, despite the fact that we've met the endpoints in the trials. And I think that through the whole process, um, the gift to us was that women wrote us every single day. So those same women that we'd spent time with uh, cheered us on, uh, told us why we needed to keep going. And so in, in any of our darkest points, I think any one of us in the company probably went to our email and, and read those uh, things. And one woman in particular along the way actually had been in one of the early clinical trials for us. And she'd written me and said, I want to tell you about my experience. She was in what's called an open label trial, so she knew she was on Addy. Um, and so she lived outside of DC. I went in to, to sit down with her one of my trips up there, and you know, she walked in the room and she was, she was in charge. Like total type A, owned her own business, raised two beautiful boys, told me about her house, which sounded like an HGTV home. Um, she had a great marriage to her husband and basically said, um, but I'm waiting for the day that we divorce. And she said, I've succeeded in every aspect of my life other than this. And I looked at her, and it was, to me, the portrait of a woman. She had completely sort of turned inside. I think this is a woman who had raised her hand time and time again. Something's wrong. Something's different. This isn't right. I'm not happy with this. And I think she had been, because of that narrative, regrettably dismissed. You have small boys. You're super stressed. Um, and it was that writing off the psychological basis of it. And so, of course, I say, or can I show you something? She says, sure. I you know, flip open my MacBook. I'm totally geeking out with brain scans. Like, look at this. Here's a prefrontal cortex, blah, blah, blah. And I have totally lost her. And I turn to her, and she's pouring tears. And those who know me know I'm a crier. So as soon as she's pouring tears, I'm pouring tears. And it was that moment of, this is why we're doing it. This is validation. She now knows it's not me. I knew. I knew all along something was different. And I think fundamentally that advocacy, I think that women need to have in women's health, that departure of our industry from funding that um, propelled us forward. So what did we do? That's my story to say. That story made me say, you know what? I'm going to dispute the FDA. So that is a path available to drug manufacturers. I like to call it the road less traveled. <laughs> um, so we made a decision to dispute. And when we made that decision, uh, the FDA has to agree that you have merit to that dispute. You go to what I affectionately call the Supreme Court of the FDA. That's not really what they are. But it's a panel who basically hears your case. Um, they hear from you. They hear from the division reviewing you. And as a result of that, they gave us a path forward. We then did additional studies. They had an another two actually public meetings, one in which they invited in women and just listened to them. And that is the best thing we can do in healthcare. Who better to inform our decisions than the patients who are living with it? That was wonderful and I give FDA big credit for having opened their doors to the public and I give big credit to women who dared to show up and open the doors of their bedroom to tell a federal agency <coughs> what's going on. That required extraordinary bravery. Those women are why this drug got approved. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, that scientific group weighed in, 18 to 6, they voted to approve us, and we got it done. Okay, so there, there's a lot there. Okay, so I want to take it back a little bit and start talking. I want to talk about the dark moments. I think that's important because I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that have unrealistic expectations of building a company and what it actually takes. So go back to those dark moments and really talk about how you persevered through them, how you got your team through that most importantly. What did, you, what did you really do and say to get your team through those dark moments? So in three words, it's blood, sweat, tears, right? That's what you live every day. Um, I don't know that I have any wisdom other than more than anyone else in this room other than the conviction keeps you there, right? And for us, 
we were a company that surprised people that we were 24 people actually in our headquarters here um, at the moment in time we got this approved. And it was 24 people who had made a conscious decision uh, when they joined the mission that we were going to change the conversation in female sexuality. We love to say we were a company that could entirely fit in an elevator um, who was going to change the world uh, and in, our, in our small way. It might have been a freight elevator at the end, but uh, an elevator all the same. And, and look, I, I think that those dark moments, you look to the source of inspiration. Right? Why are you doing it in the first place? For me, it was the stories of the women. Uh, it was giving them a voice that they hadn't had in the healthcare conversation. Um, and, um, and it was being fueled by that injustice. I think you know, even hearing uh, the inspiration from Jess, why she do it, right? It's the moment in which you say, oh my gosh, I have to do something about this. And when you don't get the funding, or you're up against the roadblock, or you don't get the tweet back, um, you, you just think, I live to fight another day because I'm going to see it through no matter what. I think it's super important. Obviously, you've gone, you built Sprout uh, to a very successful exit, right? So now you exited Sprout. What is, talk, let's talk a little about the pink ceiling because I know that we're going to have a lot of questions from the audience. So let's talk about the pink ceiling and what that's all about. Um, so the, the pink ceiling, and I've got a great group of my team who's in here tonight. You guys raise your hand if you're here from the pink ceiling. All women um, and spectacular ones at that. So our, this is the luxury of now having succe successfully exited a couple times. How do we help propel others to success who have breakthroughs for women? Um, so whether it be helping uh, in go-to-market strategy or through investment, that's what we're all about. Um, we're not a VC. Uh, we're some weird hybrid between VC meets uh, incubator. Uh, my t I brought my team with me, to people who quite frankly also don't fit uh, in big environments. They're builders. And if we can really help roll up our sleeves, sit alongside you, and get you to the finish line, that's what we're here for. On women initiatives, do the founders coming to you have to be women? They don't. In fact, our first project that we have announced, my, my focus is are we breaking through for women? Breaking through either in a social conversation uh, that I believe is very important that we're having, or maybe breaking through and opening a category, right? Our greatest legacy with Addy will be, in fact, if many more products come to market, no drug is one size fits all. So women will benefit from a variety of options. In our first partnership, um, it's in fact male founders who are working on a nail technology that detects if there's a date rape drug in your drink. Um, and that just you know, blows me away uh, from the perspective of the technology, uh, how, how uh, good it is, as well as just what this has the capacity to do in the conversation we're having right now around campus violence and how we address it. I have a niece who's a, a sophomore, um, and so this is near and dear to my heart. I can't get to market fast enough, and we're delighted to be now rolled up sleeves alongside them, helping that happen. You're taking on this huge initiative, obviously, and then going to invest and cons essentially consult in these companies. And you just launched recently, so tell us about essentially the first time. I guess it's been 30, 30 so 60 days around that. <laughs> so just tell us about, let's just go back, just tell us a little bit about those first uh, those first days and how everything's going with you so far. Let's see. We're still trying to get into space, um, so we're, uh, we're we're looking forward to that. Um, but that's kind of the breed that we are. Uh, we'll roll with the punches. We've been overwhelmed, in fact, by how uh, flattering it has been. How many people have come to us, um, and we're really going through the, these pink pitches that have come our way. Um, so our days are not unlike your days. Um, it's morning to night, living, breathing, uh, the startup and, uh, and the challenges that come with that uh, right along the way. Bandwidth, how do you manage it? Um, how do you decide what to take on, what not to take on, how to spend your time most wisely? Um, so we're, we're in that stage right now, but delighted by the opportunities that are in front of us. So if somebody wants to pitch to you, what do they have to do? Do they send you something? Do they, how do they get in front of you to pitch what they're trying to do? Yeah, it's really straightforward. Go to thepinkceiling.com. Uh, we have a pink pitch right on there. Um, our site, here's a perfect example. Uh, we got some wonderful uh, press attention 
our full site isn't up yet, so not all of our criteria are there. Um, so the, the f folks who get in first maybe get a, a better a better deal because they're not having to meet with such rigor all the criteria out there. But the team is communicating back with those companies right now just in the things that we're, we're looking for and if they're a right fit for us. So anybody has something, send to Cindy soon, please. <laughs> That's super important. So before we open up the questions, I really want to touch on the female founder thing. And we do live in a world that's dominated by male founders. So being a female founder, how do you overcome a lot of those objections that you're going to face when building a company? Um, so you guys can imagine me, right, showing up to J.P. Morgan Healthcare to talk to a bunch of bankers about female financial, right? <laughs> All in pink. Um, so look, I, I think that you, you learn along the way uh, and for me in particular, because it was a sensitive subject matter, because there was going to be giggles at the front end of it or, or jokes, um, I started with the brain scans, right? I would point to the brain scans. Are we all looking at the same picture? And I think that um, that helped overcome in just my particular area, um, you know, addressing the conversation from a, uh, a database way, if you will. But look, I, I think for, uh, for every female founder in this room, you know exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and when you show up there, that's gonna come across. Um, so I, I, I'm delighted that there are more fo people focused on investing uh, in women, that finally we see more of that diversity in funds and everything else, but we still have a long way to go. So what is the greatest piece of advice you'd give any you have a woman that wants to start a company. Yeah. She's got an idea. Yeah. What's the one piece of advice that you'd give her to move forward? I know this one. <laughs> um, be unapologetic. That is my advice to you. Uh, unapologetic about your mission, why you're doing it, how you ask for what you need help with. Um, I think that there is a um, male-female dynamic that has a tendency to say, uh, hey, I'm sorry, but I just want to know, right? Or you raise your hand and you say, can I ask a question? You just did. Ask the question. So my advice to all women is be unapologetic. We would not have gotten and broken through with the first ever drug for you know, low desire in women if we weren't unapologetic about that mission to our core to our core, we had a lot of critics, obviously along the way, they were either scared of medication uh, coming forward in this category, um, or they didn't understand patient advocacy um, at its heart, and this was a wonderful modern day story, if you will, of patient advocacy, and we were unapologetic. It was a, our greatest privilege to have a front row seat to that. Um, and I think that in our industry, we stood out in that way, because there tends to be a fear-based way of doing business. Um, you know, we're, it's pharma, it's regulated, um, you know, patient contact, et cetera. We were unapologetic about that connection, I think, to what we were doing and why we were trying to do it.
I'm a huge advocate on reading. I think everybody should read. You should continue to read. Always be learning every step of the way. So what are two books that you would recommend for every founder to read? I like to, I might admit that I, I, I read, I read in, in Twitter world, so I don't read the expansive, but, um, but my, uh, I've read some great articles today that I've already shared. Um, no, I'll tell you, I'm going to give one book, um, and it's, I have one that I've always loved, it is the, it's, it's Purple Cow. Does anybody know it in the room? It's a little old school at this point, right? But Seth Godin, I think, is one of the most brilliant minds in marketing. And here's the concept, basically. Um, it is, you know, imagine you get to go on the vacation of a lifetime next week. You fly on that new Delta Direct to Paris, right, with your significant other. You get off the plane, you're driving, and you're like, honey, look at those cows over there in the field, right? Isn't it so beautiful? About 10 minutes in, you're not even going to notice them anymore. That's just the truth of us. We're inundated with everything. It's our sort of attention span today. But if there was a purple cow on the side of the road, you'd wake up, right? It is about standing out in a sea of sameness. And I think that book really have, is a lot of the philosophy I've applied to my companies. I've found the people who stand out in a sea of sameness, the people who didn't fit in those organizations that homogenized um, you know, everybody as best they could to their way. Um, and I think that your approach should always stand out in a sea of sameness. So purple, purple cow philosophy, um, I'll call it a pink cow. <laughs> New York too. Yes, you know. So one last question. I'm trying to respect time here, and I know we got off to a little late start, but I wanted to bring up all those great companies. Uh, when you think of the word successful, let's just talk about female founders. When you think of the word successful, who is the first female founder or business leader that comes to your mind? Sarah Blakely, because all women wear Spanx. <laughs> they might not be inspired, but hell if it's not true. And she made a billion dollars doing it, and for that I bow down to her. Like, look, this is as basic as I know a problem that you might have as well, and here is the solution. So look, I'm a, I'm a huge fan um, of the work she's done. I'm a huge fan of value creation. And I think this is one of the conversations that as a room tonight of entrepreneurs, we should all be having with one another. Because, you know, we talk a lot about social entrepreneurship. I consider myself a social entrepreneur. I want to do the work that is going to have an impact sort of larger than my little piece of it, if you will, in the world. And yet we can't lose sight of are we a for-profit or a non-profit, right? You will do the best, the best good. The, you will give the most back if you create the most value and then ultimately pay it forward. And I think the old school mentality is, you know, get as much as you can and, and then give it away and that's fine. I think you can be more thoughtful than that in the supply chain or wherever else on how you do it, but ultimately it is your job to create value. And I would say, you know, in those moments when you're analyzing your business and whether you've got something there, you really do have to consider um, you know, what is this exit? What is the value creation? Um, whether or not you've got something really viable. So what I want to do is turn it over to you guys to ask some questions. I think it's super important. I don't know all the questions, so when you guys come up, or you got, let's just stand up and make it easier and just ask your question. Again, this is our first time really delving into the life sciences world. We're mostly in the tech side, so I think it's super important. Come up, ask your question, and let's go from there. So who's going to be the first one to ask a question? Go ahead, CJ. CJ and I are going to swap out our outfits. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that when I wore this today. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I actually signed up on Pink Ceiling to Pitch, and I hope I get selected to pitch. Um, where does cultural fit come into the selection process for you when you're hiring? Is it like one of the first things that you look for, or is it the second thing you look for? How do you make that part of your hiring process? Thank you so much for that question. It's number one. So culture first um, in, in our organizations. Uh, I think because the, the premise, if you will, of Slate was clean slate, our own terms, how do you find people who are great achievers, uh, but it's really self, completely self-driven, right? They're in environments in which they're completely uninspired. Um, what is that and how do we take them into an environment in which they have permission to be them and watch them achieve things maybe even greater than they anticipated. So for me, it's always culture first. 
So I am coming from the life science side. Uh, I'm curious, can you go back a little further and explain how you got into the pharma sector? Uh, it, 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 typically, you can't just go in there. Uh, you need to have uh, credentials. You need to have the science to, to build on. Uh, so be curious what your background is and how you ended up there. Uh, and and uh, any thoughts around that? Sure. So I'm going to be a little bit of an unusual story. So I had a great, here's a perfect example. This was a great mentor of mine, a business professor. Um, actually in school, and one of our you know, weekly assignments was we had to read about, com I think I fell in love a lot with companies through that class and what made small companies tick, what made great, you know, big companies great. Um, and so when I graduated, I told her, I'm going to go work for Merck. And she said, oh, I think it needs to be a little broader, like you're going to go to farm. I'm like, no, no, just Merck. Why Merck? Because Merck was Fortune's most admired company at the time. And my belief was if I went and learned from the best, I could take it with me anywhere. And the truth is, I don't think I believed I'd stay in pharma. I thought I was going to go learn from the best. And what happened is I adored the science. Um, I'm not a science person by background. At this point, I think I've been surrounded by um, science geeks for so long, I like to consider myself an honorary member. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it was actually to go and learn from the best. And I did get to be there, luckily, at a period of time in which there was a lot of launch and innovation. And Big Pharma had a little bit of a different look than it does today. And I think as that started to change, as there started to become this disconnect from the patients, I knew that I should go smaller. Smaller, 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 until crazy enough to start now. Is life science a focus for you with Big Sailor? It, it, it's naturally a lot of the opportunities that we get to, and, and for the very reasons discussed earlier, healthcare and women's healthcare is so important to me. Um, it's underfunded. It, it used to be truly pharma companies had it on their banner, like we are in women's health. At this point, it's never there, um, and I think that. Um, you know, the, the notion that women are so complicated, it's difficult in clinical trials, is, is all nonsense. Uh, and in fact, we were, again, we're very proud of the fact that with Addy, we were, we were the largest ever new drug application for women. We'd studied something uniquely in and for women in 11,000 women. I have a question about Addy. Yes. So I am wondering about how it led there. Did you acquire the, you know, the science, yeah. or did you create the science? So a little both. Um, so we acquired uh, some of uh, the originator's science, um, and then we went out and did additional work, uh, additional pivotal trial, as well as challenge studies for Addy. Um, so we took it from an innovator who was going to walk away. They were truly going to put it on the shelf. And, uh, and knowing that that just didn't seem to make sense based on how promising the science was, we stepped in and then took it the rest of the way. <coughs> On the journey, when one is starting onto the journey of entrepreneurship, when one is starting onto the journey of entrepreneurship, so do you think one should have a backup plan or we should just go and give our hundred percent? I don't believe in backup plans. <laughs> All in. All in until you're until it's clear, right? I think if you have a backup plan, you're leaving um, something in your mind for an out, and you should be so convicted that you're gonna see that one all the way through. So, could you speak a little bit, and this sort of relates to the type of people you're hiring and culture, but also how authenticity plays into being a successful founder, because I think one of the challenges that some women have, and, you know, with Sword and some other things that I do, mentor a lot of young women, and it's a matter of how to blend being yourself in an authentic way, but then being successful in maybe a different male-dominated space. And I think that's possible, but it does take a little bit of art. So I'd love to hear you just speak about how that plays into it. Um, I don't know that I know any other way other than to be authentically you, right? I think maybe that's a sub theme, that's some variation on me saying unapologetic, yeah. right? Authentically you. Um, in no way editing your behavior to think this is what it should look like, this is what I should wear, this is what I should say, absolutely not. I think if you're in an environment where you're thinking it through that much, go to a different environment. Again, if you find the place where you are authentically, unapologetically you and given a path to succeed. Um, there's no other way, right? In fact, I think um, from our standpoint, the, the authenticity of why we were doing it, of the, 
the types of people in my team that I was so privileged to be surrounded by is they authentically were in it for all the right reasons and that connected with people. And that gave us the advantage of women telling us their stories and opening up the doors of their bedroom and helping us really be a better company and organization to answer the need. Do you feel that entrepreneurship is more nature or nurture than person? It's hard, right? Because I look at it through my own lens. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my lens is that I'm, I'm that way, yeah. right? That I don't fit, that I go to big environments and I'm like, yeah, no thanks. Um, <laughs> you move along, uh, start something else. Uh, so, you know, can it, can it be taught? Um, I think you have to have the gut instinct that is some difference. If you look around, like if any of you in the room look around, you know, to your friends who maybe aren't gutting it out in the same way you are, they're more content. It's really just a risk tolerance, isn't it? Like, isn't that really what it is uh, that's the difference between you and somebody else and no backup plan, like I'm gonna go for it, and your friends might be like, oh, I don't know, I'm gonna play it a little safer. Um, I think that that is instinctively there um, for entrepreneurs. I think you can recognize them when they walk in. I mean, to the point of cultural fit, like you recognize that coming through your door and how they're gonna move at the same clip that you move at, um, and they're gonna have that same conviction that you have. I'm curious, for Pink Solid, what's your plan or vision for that in the short term and in the long term? What impact do you want to achieve? Well, the impact is how do we help projects, again, that are going to open up new categories for women, um, or they're going to change social conversations. So our greatest impact is if we can help somebody with a real solution to a real problem get to market. Um, and I think that we've done it before and we believe we can apply those lessons learned, fails and successes, um, to helping other people get there. Um, so if we can be part of breaking through for women in a way that helps other achieve, others achieve success the way we have, that's the, that's the goal. And that's the long term. This isn't really the short term play. Nobody can come in and take out my pink ceiling. Um, so this is now me for the long haul, what I hope to do. <coughs> Uh, thanks for sharing your story. Uh, what is the measure for your mechanism to measure success? Value creation. From my standpoint, um, in, in, my, in my personal life or my professional, I'm going to answer the professional. <laughs> my professional life, well, maybe even in my personal, I hope I create value for all of my friends and, and loved ones, but um, value creation. And I think I say that because I do think that's a topic in conversation right now um, that we're almost missing a little bit in entrepreneurship is talking about that component of it. We want it, we all want to do big things. We want to change the world. We have you know very clear points of view on how we do that. Um, but value creation, I think, is the definition of success. Many would argue with me, right? They would say purpose, Pur just having the purpose. Uh, and the, and the uh, moxie, if you will, to go out there and do it, is, is definitionally successful. Um, I think that's great, but ultimately success is going to be defined on what, you're, what you do with it and what value you create from doing that. What can the region do, or, or what are you not finding to enable entrepreneurs? Um, what do we need more of? I think we need more collaboration, right? I, when I first came to this area, I've been here for a little over a decade, I was, I was sort of struck by the fact that between Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, we felt like we were individual areas, and I'm pretty much thinking, I think it's a triangle, and I can drive like 20 <laughs> minutes and get to one, and I just moved like from DC, and it took me 20 minutes to get to the end of my street, so I think we're all like one. Um, I don't know if that's changed. You know, I, it, it, this is a luxury for me tonight, I should say that. I'm so grateful to be here, because I think for 10 years I've had my head down doing nothing but building it um, and building organizations. But I think that's still there. I think there's still that sort of infighting between the three, and if you think about if we combine efforts, what a formidable force we would be. I, I'll tell you what I did after, um, after exit. Uh, people say, where'd you go? Did you go to you know, Tahiti or something? I was like, no, I went to Silicon Valley. And people are like, what? 
<laughs> that is a bad answer. But you know what, I, I did it on purpose because I, I raised a lot of my money actually through private investment. So partially because people told me I couldn't do it in pharma and that made me want to do it. Um, and then, you know, it just happened that I had wonderful investors who also were very committed to the mission. Um, so they were truly, uh, you know, double bottom line type investors who cared about the cause as well. But I went there to see, like, what's the mystique? Because I knew a lot of VCs out there, so I sort of shadowed them and, and saw what it was all about. And I'm telling you what, I don't know that they have so much on Raleigh. Right? I, I love the expression, right, the, the unicorn, and I like to say, let them be the unicorns and we'll be the workhorses. Let's just be the workhorses and get it done. I think that's a mentality in this area and a true strength that we can, we can work off of. Um, not so much on the entrepreneur side, but how did you perceive the difficulties, I think, that exist as a result of insurance companies also looking at women and issues with women differently. Yeah. Because who's going to pay for it? a lot of the products? Yeah. Um, so in our particular case, we actually had a conversation around parity that was very helpful, right? We knew that 80% of men with private managed insurance had access to one of the PD-5s. Those are the Viagra, the Alice, the Vitro type drugs. Um, and so for us, the conversation began with, well, if 80% of male lives get access to one of these, wouldn't women have access to it? So I, I think maybe it's unfortunate that that was the construct of the discussion, right, that we had to come in from that basis. Um, we do have a long way to go, I think, in women's health. And part of that is that we say, so I'm going to give all women a challenge here tonight. Um, we love to say, women are complicated. And we as women often go right, yes we are, <laughs> right? Not good. We're all complicated. Sex is complicated. Male or female sex is complicated. And I think we get an, almost a pass, right, by saying that. Uh, we get a pass by saying that in terms of clinical studies. We get a pass by saying that in conditions that uniquely affect women. We sort of just, oh, the easiest way to make sure that no progress happens is to say, oh, that's complicated. So I'm going to have all women leave the room tonight and not do the complicated anymore. Because in fact, men are being harmed in that too, right? We are we are underappreciating. I think the the full uh, the full picture with you guys too. Um, I don't want this to be just pharma based, but I understood fully the whole men's sexual health. Yeah. Does this work in women? Why do you think, and not just pharma based, but why is there such a gap in healthcare with treating that you know with that you know, men's health, Viagra, people pay cash for Viagra, they'll, you know, they'll do it, they'll sure. their home, but you know, women's health getting stuff developed, it's, it's, the gap was crazy, I mean, I, yeah. I understand it's a testosterone market, well, can I put that in a woman, you know, and yeah. it's, uh, sure. I'm just curious what your thoughts were from an insider standpoint. I, I think it really is as simple as mm -hmm. we automatically accept the biology in men, we just accept it. Uh, we address it, we're very scientific about it. I think with women, we create this constellation, if you will, of complexity um, and psychology at play. I mean, it is the story, right, of the woman sitting next to me and knowing full well that something had changed. So women with this condition, um, they've known a normal before. It has changed. That change has persisted it's causing profound distress. By the time most women got into our clinical trials, they lived with this for five years, right? Um, and yet, she had been patted on the shoulder and said, like, you're stressed. You have boys. You're busy. And, and I think that is what, that's the why. The why is that when you get to medicine, you consider all the factors, right? You consider biology, you consider psychology, and we overweight psychology with women and, and frankly overweight biology with men. That's my belief. When you're building out a concept, is your exit strategy flexible or is it kind of burn the boats to the shore? Like, how does that come to play from the beginning all the way to the end? Yeah, I think you always have an, an, ide an ideal probably um, out of it, but you've got to play the, you got to play it with the, with the, oh my god, I was about to say backup plan. I take it back. <laughs> um, we, you, you've got to uh, look for us. We knew there were two versions, right? We were going to take the company public 
and fund the launch, or we were going to ultimately sell it to somebody who probably had better resources to take our baby into the world at large. You know, I've never be built a global pharmaceutical business. It's not my strength. Addie's a global brand. It needed a global footprint. So I think we had a clear sight of what it was, but knew that. Um, we also had the ability to go out and do it ourselves if we needed to. At some point, somebody was going to come in and take us out. Gotcha. Is there always two avenues, or is there ever a chance of just one? Thing? Just one? Um, well, there's all, I think there's one way that you're determined to see through, right? Right. Um, and I guess our one way was that we were going to see this through and return to our shareholders a spectacular return for having kept the faith and done the right thing. Every time we, we went to the FDA and they said, that'll be another study, that was like, that'll be another $3 million. That'll be another $5 million. And they stayed with me. And so my responsibility leading that was to ultimately pay that back to them. Yes. So I assume there are more unmet needs with female Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe you can tell us what's the next hot thing. Oh, I have the best story. OK, so I have, to tell, I have to tell you guys this story. There are a lot, right? There are a lot of conditions that I think we say, like, oh, well, that's just a woman's condition. Like, we sort of aren't sure about it. Um, and in fact, uh, I think that's what happened in many ways in HSCD. Uh, I'm gonna just, if you'll indulge me for one second. What Addy treats is a condition that is a medical condition. Desire for women fluctuates. That's normal. You guys are probably pretty tired. You work pretty hard. Sometimes you're like, honey, not tonight, right? That's normal. Um, if you lose it completely, it's gone for a long time. It's causing you severe distress. It could be that there's a brain chemical imbalance. We know that now. Um, and that you can't regain through will. It helps through medicine. Not unlike probably a model that we understand in the room would be depression, right? We, you take an antidepressant to restore back to a normal that you once knew. It's one of the reasons I hate female Viagra. Um, as, a, as a misnomer, um, because I think it, it communicates an on-demand, and women are not on-demand creatures when it comes to it. It's not an instant fix. Um, but because of that, right, because it's normal for desire to fluctuate, I think that we dismissed women with a medical condition, because we looked at it through our own lens, if that was normal for us. And, um, and so I sat down. I was on a flight back to Raleigh from LA. And I said, this woman is coming walking toward me, and she's an actress. I'm going to tell you who she is. Um, and so she's coming toward me. She sits down next to me. She's very friendly, talking to me, talking to me. And then she reaches over and says, I'm so-and-so. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Um, I, I got that a long time ago. Uh, but she's like, what do you do? What do you do? And you know, I tell her I'm in pharma, and, and I have a women's health company. And she said, a product that I would know. And I said, well, yes, the media calls it female Viagra. That's not really what it is. And she's like, oh. I don't know how I feel about that. And I said, good thing it's a long flight. Um, but you know, that, that is a good, right? That's a moment, you guys know this in Billy, but that's a good moment, right? Because that'll be insightful to me. So I said, no, really, tell me why. Like, this is a good conversation for us to have. And she basically said, isn't it just normal? Right, it's just normal, and you know, I, I'm not sure we should treat it, et cetera. And so I told her all about, like, the, you don't understand, there's brain scan imaging, and we get it, and this can be brain chemical imbalance. So she's right there with me. Now we've bonded. She goes, hey, by the way, um, I have this condition that I've lived with since I was 16. And she said, it's icy. And I said, oh, interstitial cystitis. And she eyes get big. Oh, you know what that is? I said, sure, I do. And uh, I said, but I don't know how I feel about it. And she said, what? <laughs> Well, I don't know, should we treat it? And she goes, okay, touche. Uh, and I said, but exactly. And that is why there isn't a pharmaceutical company right now investing in understanding that condition. Because we've told her, just like she's been told since she's 16, and look, she has a pretty interesting life. And she's had an interesting life for many years. And they said, you're stressed, you're this, you're that. I am fortunate that I know that world, and I knew a, there's a urologist in um, Palm Springs who's doing really spectacular study in it, and I said, go see them. She said, how have I gone to every doctor in LA and nobody's told me this? It's like the secret of women's health, right? That is a condition that we sort of dismiss because we can't quite figure it out,
but somebody's actually doing great work there, and she'll have real help for it. Did that answer the question? Sounds like there's a lot more to do. <laughs> so I mean, I see infertility, right? Um, there are so many areas of women's health that deserve a lot more attention um, and research. So when you're building something of that magnitude scale, and you're solving such a big problem, like how do you convey that vision to everyone else? Yeah. A lot of people don't see that immediately. So you know, if you're choking to do like 10, 20 years type of range, how do you convince some people that this is the solution? I think you, you convince people through your own passion, right? Um, they might not see it as clearly as you do, but they'll see that you're the person probably to see it through there. Um, so, you know, for, for ours in terms of the exit, like I said, I, we didn't set out to create a billion dollar drug. Um, that wasn't the goal. Actually, the goal was uh, to change the conversation and to give women the ability to say yes or no themselves, whatever they decided. At least they had the choice. Um, so I think people could get that. Uh, and then the success came as a result of that, clear, that, that clarity of vision. Any more? Okay, I'm going to get just a, a tiny bit sappy here. And my biggest thing is, my mentor is always my grandmother, okay? And she's 93 years strong. And one of the things she always taught me was to respect women. That's what she always taught me. Treat them as equals. And I mean, so many women entrepreneurs out there that don't believe in themselves. I talk to them all the time. They don't believe they can do it. So the next time you believe that you can't do it, I always tell them, look in the mirror, and tell yourself you can do it, okay? And if you ever need anything from me, any of my connections, whatever you need from me, um, email me, call me anytime, because I think it's super important that we have diversity, especially when it comes to entrepreneurs, okay? So with that, I'm gonna leave it there. I wanna thank Cindy so much for being here, okay? Um, quickly, just wanna thank our sponsors. Winston Domo in the back, thank you so much. Alexandria, you guys are the best. Lone Rider for providing us with the beer. Big Pixel, you guys need any development work done, uh, take a look at them. HQ Raleigh, and everything else in between. Guys, thank you so much. Give Cindy a huge round of applause for me.